Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm Ron Casimer. I'm Associate Provost here at the New School. And I'm uh, proud and honored to be um, been asked to moderate this panel. And um, we want to have as much time as possible for our panelists to um, present and also for you to engage with them. So I'd like to get us started um, right away. So I will briefly introduce the panelists and, um, and then ask them uh, to present each presentation uh, one after the other, and then we will open up the floor for questions. Uh, so, going from uh, to my left, uh, which seems to be the only place to go, uh, but immediate left, Kristen Mackay um, is, uh, will be our first speaker. And Kristen is a PhD candidate in the Department of Government at Cornell University. Um, she's currently completing her dissertation uh, which explores variation in the development of rule of law across sub-Saharan Africa, especially relating to constraints on executive power. Kristen told me she um, recently finished field research in Uganda and Zambia as part of that project, um, which was supported by a National Science Foundation doctoral dissertation grant. And um, she is presenting uh, a paper that she has co-written with uh, Professor Nicholas Van der Waal at, the, at Cornell. Um, next, uh, Robert Bates, uh, who was scheduled to be on this panel, uh, could not join us due to illness, but we were very, very fortunate um, at a, with very short notice to have a colleague of Professor Bates, Jean Vier Mkunziza, <coughs> present his paper. Um, and I will tell you a little bit about uh, Jean Vier. Unfortunately, we won't get to hear a lot of his, uh, his own work and ideas, but it, it's a very, he has a very impressive uh, uh, background himself. He is currently macroeconomic policy advisor at the UN Development Program in the Human Development Report Office. And since 2009, um, he has also been working at the African Economic Research Consortium, which is based in Nairobi. Uh, previously, he was economic affairs officer at the UN Economic Commission for Africa a visiting scholar at the IMF, and a postdoctoral fellow and researcher at Harvard, and coordinator of the discussion group on African politics in the Institute of Politics. Thank you very much for coming and accepting the last minute for uh, Professor Bates. Uh, then we have um, Dr. George Eite. Uh, he is president of the Free Africa Foundation and contributor to numerous scholarly volumes and articles. Um, that have been published um, in journals, many journals. Um, he's published quite a few books, including Africa Unchained, The Blueprint for Development, African Chaos, um, and Africa Betrayed. Uh, he's testified before Senate, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Presidential Advisory Council on HIV AIDS, House Africa <coughs> Subcommittee, and Standing Committee for Foreign Relations of the Senate of Canada. So welcome, uh, Dr. Eitzel. And, um, Brothers to the left is uh, Professor Mwini Wei Mui. Mui? <laughs> Sorry, I messed that up. Mwini Wei Mui, who is Assistant Professor of Political Science at Winston Salem State University in North Carolina. Uh, Dr. Mui is author of A New Paradigm of the African State, uh, co authored with Hugh Martin, and The Pitfalls of Liberal Democracy and Late Nationalism in South Africa. She's a member of the Executive Council of the Association of Third World Studies. So, very eminent panel today, and um, I would like uh, to ask Kristen um, uh, to be our first presenter. Uh, the talk is entitled, uh, her and Dr. Van, uh, Professor Van der Waal's talk is Mechanisms of Accountability in Sub Saharan Africa. I must say that one of the, the first things that I learned when I traveled to Uganda for the first time was that in Uganda, I am known as a Mzungu, which loosely translates to white person in, in Kiswahili. And so uh, I'm, I'm very grateful that among all of these uh, very knowledgeable African scholars um, that I was asked to participate as well. And my talk today is uh, on mechanism, mechanisms of accountability in Sub-Saharan Africa, pitfalls and prospects in the budget process. <laughs> Now yesterday, Professor Kasmer himself mentioned that uh, in terms of development in Africa, 
there have been some strides made, but there's still a, a long way to go. And you can kind of see this represented um, when you look at one indicator of development, which we've been talking about a lot in this, in this conference, um, in terms of, of poverty and people living below uh, the $1.25 a day standard. And as you can see at the top row, um, Africa, even though it has made some strides in the past um, 10 or 15 years, does still lag behind a lot of the other regions of the world. And so all of us here are interested in looking at you know, why there is this lackluster development in Africa. And so my talk today is going to focus on one very narrow and specific um, part of, of the development uh, process, and that is the national budget process in African countries. And in fact, I want to look at not the whole budget process, because that's A, very complex, and B, not that interesting. Um, but I do want to look at what I call mechanisms of accountability within that budget process. And to start off, the budget process is linked to development in a number of different ways. The first way is through identifying spending priorities. So making sure that national budgets are allocating money toward um, strategic development purposes, so that you're putting money towards schools and roads rather than, say, you know, a, a private jet for the president or more arms for the military. So that's the first way the budget is linked to development. The second way the budget is linked to development is through expenditure management. This basically gets to service delivery. Um, you know, are, are, are services being delivered in a timely manner? Um, are they being, you know, built with quality materials? Basically, effective use of resources um, for the implementation of these budget projects. And the third way that the budget, national budget process into development is through auditing and reporting. So once the budget has been passed and the project implemented, um, going back and making sure that funds did reach their targets, um, and also if, if they didn't, or if there was misuse of funds, publicizing that in some way. Now in an attempt to make sure the budget process is effective and efficient, specific government um, entities and also citizens have developed many mechanisms um, to sort of track these, these things and to make sure the budget process is working toward development goals. And I've listed some of these things at the bottom in yellow, and, and these are the four that I'm going to focus mostly on today, although there are many other mechanisms of accountability within the budget process. Um, and those four are parliamentary budget committees, supreme audit institutions, citizen monitoring groups, and also elections and, and lobbying. And now the catch is just because these, these mechanisms are in place, some are you know, in place legally. Um, for instance, you know, Supreme Audit Institutions and, and budget committees are often written into the Constitution. Um, and the other ones like citizen monitoring and election and lobbying, these are established practices. Even though those mechanisms are in place, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are operating effectively or to full capacity. And so the, the, the purpose of my talk today is to look at what are some of the challenges that are faced by these various mechanisms of accountability within the budget process. And I want to identify the challenges not to frustrate ourselves, not to see you know, what, what's going wrong, um, but really to start identifying the first steps and how to address these, these, these challenges um, in order to overcome them. And, and I, I must say that, that uh, Professor Vanderbilt and I are in the early stages of this, of this project, and so a lot of what I'll present today um, it's kind of an overview of some of the research that has been done by other, other uh, political scientists and other scholars um, on some of these mechanisms and how they're working in specific um, African countries. And in my talk today, I'll mostly be highlighting Uganda um, and Benin, but I will make reference to some, some other uh, sub-Saharan countries as well. Now, before we get into the challenges faced by these mechanisms of, of accountability, I want to take a moment and step back and disaggregate this term accountability. And I know a few of our earlier panelists from this morning um, also tried to sort of parse out what accountability means exactly. In terms of political scientists, one um, really common way that we talk about accountability is meant to look at the relationship. Accountability is a very relational uh, phenomenon. And so you can kind of think about accountability in this way. A is accountable to B when A is obliged to inform B about A's actions and decisions, to justify them, and to suffer punishment in the case of misconduct. And so the three words I've highlighted in yellow are sort of the main, 
the main parts of, of this definition. And you can break them down, these three words, into sort of two dimensions. But accountability, accountability really comes down to a mix of answerability, which is part of the, the, the inform and also the justify, and then enforcement, which is the, the, the punishment aspect of this definition. You can further disaggregate the idea of accountability into sort of two different types. And I'll be talking about both of these types today. One is vertical accountability, which actually means when citizens are holding their government to account. So it's a very you know, vertical process up, up the chain. And the second is horizontal, looking at when one governmental institution holds another governmental institution accountable. And we can think of these in, in terms of checks and balances between branches of the government um, and independent oversight agencies as well that can set up within the executive branch but are independent. So I'm going to look first at some of the challenges faced by various mechanisms of accountability, vertical accountability. And the first one I want to look at is citizen monitoring. And I want to focus on a case study of, of one monitoring, budget monitoring group in Uganda called the Uganda Debt Network. And the Uganda Debt Network, Debt Network, or UDN, was established in 1996. And at first, their, their main purpose was to campaign for debt relief in Uganda. But since then, their mission has really expanded um, into organizing the public and mobilizing the public to ensure public accountability and transparency in budget planning, policy planning, and public resource usage, public resource usage in Uganda. So some of the things they do, they, they train local citizens to monitor budget, to monitor development projects going on in their, in their regions to make sure that you know, the budget money is being spent uh, correctly on projects. Um, and they also try to, to educate citizens on the budget process and how they can sort of have input into that process. And even though, though the Uganda Debt Network has really been held up as, as a really effective citizen monitoring group, they, they do face a lot of challenges. And a couple of those challenges that I wanted to highlight um, include the fact that uh, Uganda has a, a, an NGO Act passed in 2006 that really restricts NGO activity. Um, for instance, it restricts you know, who can, can hold a gathering of more than a certain number of people. Um, it, it really puts tight, tight regulations on who can be registered as an NGO and things like that. So NGOs like the Uganda Debt Network what, what happens because of, of these rules is that the NGOs really sort of step back and become a lot less political. They're afraid that if they push the envelope too much that they're going to be um, you know, deregistered, won't be able to operate in the country. So this is one challenge, you know, really facing a lot of citizen monitoring groups that register as, as NGOs, just the, the legal environment um, in, in the country. The second challenge to a lot of to, to these vertical accountability mechanisms in, in monitoring groups the lack of resources and geographical reach. Um, even though UDN um, you know, is very active, they're only active in about 17 out of 111 districts in Uganda. Um, and, you know, and they themselves say they would love to be active in a lot more, but they just don't have resources, the personnel, to do this. They also have a high rate of employee turnover. Once um, employees gain skills uh, in these type of groups, they're often poached by a lot of times developmental agencies who can pay more, or international agencies working in Uganda who can pay them more. So you get, a, you know, you, you lose a lot of the, the collective wisdom in these type of groups. The third challenge to groups like this is the information provided by the government. Um, you know, it's hard to, for, for groups of citizens to monitor the government if the government's not providing very much information. And the International Budget Partnership um, ranks countries in terms of their information provision. And Uganda is ranked, in, it's kind of a five-point scale, Uganda ranked in the middle of having some information provision. Um, so although Uganda is better than some African countries, there's still a lot of information missing um, that, that citizens could really use in order to keep the government accountable. Now, for instance, you can see here, in terms of Uganda's East African neighbors, <coughs> while Uganda itself is, is, is fairly good, so this is kind of a, a report card of how much in budget information various countries supply to their citizens that make, make public. And while Uganda's pretty good on the initial budget information, they're really good at telling citizens what they plan to do with, with, with the money, they're a lot 
They're a lot worse. They get A's and B's in that, but then they get C's and D's when you get to actual reporting of how the money was spent. So citizens aren't able to, to track what the government actually spent money on um, after you know, the regional budget is set. Um, and the, the situation is a lot bleaker in other countries of, of the region, as you can see. Uh, apparently IBP does not give F's, but gives E's uh, for the lowest score. And so countries like Sudan and Tanzania definitely, uh, definitely fail to provide much information at all to their citizens in terms of, of budgets. Now the second mechanism of accountability, vertical accountability, that I want to focus on um, includes lobbying and elections. And these, this is the classic sense of vertical accountability when you think of citizens keeping their government to account. So if citizens, in theory, if citizens monitor their government budgets and don't, don't agree with you know, what the government's doing or, or want to see different spending priorities, they can lobby the government, and if this government still doesn't do what, what they would prefer, can vote them out of office, in theory. Unfortunately, in a lot of African countries, Uganda included, there are challenges to even lobbying and, and, and voting for, for uh, rep elected representatives in Uganda. The first is the fact that a lot of the political parties in Uganda are what we call non-programmatic or non-ideological parties, which means that the parties themselves don't really have much of a, a policy platform. They don't differentiate themselves between the other parties in the country. For instance, the, in, in 2006, it was widely reported that the National Resistance Movement, which is the incumbent party in Uganda, they waited until the opposition party, FTC, released their <laughs> policy platform, and then basically copied what FTC said and released their own platform and said the same thing. Um, so that meant that voters really didn't have a choice. If they didn't like the policies of NRM, voting for the FTC wasn't going to get them anything new. Um, so that's one, one challenge in terms of citizens holding government to account in terms of elections. Another, another thing that sort of hinders this process is the fact that the donors and not voters set a lot of the, the budget and development priorities in Uganda because the Ugandan government gets 50% of its revenue from aid, therefore decreasing their reliance on taxes. And you know, as, as much as most of us probably dislike paying taxes, Taxation is really a mechanism that links the citizens to the government, um, and a reason for the citizens to demand that their government um, you know, really take their, their preferences and development uh, priorities into consideration. So having this disconnect, having this alternate source of, of revenue, really allows the government to not necessarily be worried about citizen development priorities. And the third challenge I like to bring up in terms of, of things that hinder vertical accountability is really citizens Ugandan's view of their own efficacy in terms of holding the government to account. In Afrobarometer surveys, which are public opinion surveys done across Africa, in 2006, 52% of Ugandan citizens do not view holding leaders to account as their duty. They see it someone else's job to hold leaders to account, not their own. And you can see it when we, when we expand as across Africa that Uganda I don't, I don't know if you can read the, uh, the chart very well, but Uganda is actually fairly high. You know, we think, you know, 52% of people think that they don't have to hold government accountable. That sounds pretty high, but in fact, in other, in other countries, Namibia, Nigeria, Lesotho, it's even, it's even lower. It's in, in the, the, the single digits. And so clearly, if citizens don't see it as their job to hold governments to account, that's a real challenge to having effective vertical accountability in the budget process. Now moving on to the second type of uh, me uh, mechanism of, of accountability, and this is horizontal accountability. And again, this is when one government institution is holding another government institution to account. And this case study focuses on Benin, um, in terms of the National Assembly Finance Committee. And this is the parliamentary committee that is tasked with really following budget issues and, and recommending to the larger parliament um, how Parliament should vote or amend the national, the, the executive, the, the budget that the executive puts forward. Now, parliamentary budget committees are really hindered, um, both in, in Benin and across the, the continent, in a number of ways. First, there's little technical support given to a lot of these parliamentary committees. You know, budgets are a very technical thing. If you're not an economist or, or an accountant, it can be very confusing what, you know, what this budget even says. And a lot of uh, members of parliament, they're not given any support. They're not given a budget office that, that has a staff 
that is able to translate these things for the members of parliament to explain to them what the budget says. So it's really hard for parliament to hold the executive to account if parliament can't understand what the budget is even proposing. The second thing in, in Benin, but this also happens in, in other countries as well, um, the executive has used the vague Article 68 three times between 1998 and 2003 to circumvent the legislature and pass the budget by decree due to the fact that he said there was a national crisis going on. And of course, national crisis is a very vague term. You can invoke that for almost any reason. And so basically the legal framework in terms of this horizontal accountability um, leaves a lot of loopholes where the executive can, even though the, the, the parliament is supposed to be a very integral um, partner in developing the budget, the executive has ways to circumvent parliament um, wholesale. And so that really breaks down this idea of horizontal accountability. And finally, one other challenge to, to, um, to the National Assembly Finance Committee in Benin is the fact that their funding is often restricted by the executive. So if they want to um, initiate an inquiry into sort of budget mismanagement, a lot of times they'll ask the executive for funds to do this, and of course the executive doesn't want to hand the funds over. Um, so not having uh, autonomy in their, their own budget um, really hinders this type of uh, horizontal accountability. And finally, the last mechanism of horizontal accountability that I wanted to, to talk about are supreme audit institutions. Um, and these, these are institutions that are they're usually part of the executive, but they're, they're independent from, from the president um, and, and, and the rest of the, the bureaucracy. And they have jurisdiction over um, budget audits. So they report on how the budget was executed and report on you know, any mismanagement, any corruption that was found in, in, in terms of the budget process. So to go back to Uganda, I want to focus on the Ugandan Auditor General. And a couple of challenges to the Auditor General in Uganda is the fact that the AG is not autonomous. He can be fired at any time by the President without having to get the approval of Parliament um, or, or anyone else. And so that means the Auditor General, just like the, the, the citizen groups, are hesitant to become political for fear that they're going to be clamped down on. The Auditor General also is afraid to sort of go too far and, and you know, bring on the wrath of, of the executive. In Uganda also, the Auditor General, there, there are certain parts of the budget that are kind of off limits for auditing. Um, these are, they're, they're labeled as classified expenditures. And a lot of these have to do with things like the President's security force, um, the office of the President himself. Um, so there's you know, key sectors that, that don't get audited at all just because of this, this label of classified expenditure. And finally, funding is another, another challenge to the Auditor General. Um, a lot of times they're given more and more responsibilities every year, but not extra funding for more staff, more equipment. So it's really hard to do a good job if, if you don't have resources to do, to, do, to do your job. And you can see in terms of Uganda and their East, their East African neighbors, Uganda is pretty low on this account. There are other countries in the region, Kenya and Rwanda in specific, um, that are a lot better. Um, but still, this is on a scale of 100. So even Kenya, that seems to be a, a really high performer, you know, they're still, they're still quite lacking in the power that the, that the Auditor General has um, in, in the budget process. Now, I know I've given you a lot of, of challenges to these, these mechanisms of accountability. Um, but I, I do want to say that there are a couple reasons for hope. There are some prospects um, where, where the citizen, both citizens and the government entities themselves are trying to find ways to improve their capacity. And one, a couple things I'm going to point to. Um, one is the Affiliated Network for Social Accountability. And this is a, a network of budget monitoring groups across Africa. Um, that, that share best practices. They, they come together and try to talk about strategies that have been successful in their countries and, and share them with other, other groups. And so they're doing a lot of good work. They have a, a website and they have, have conferences. So they, they really try to, um, to, to support each other. Something else that, uh, that has been going on a lot in terms of these are now more sort of the horizontal mechanisms. Um, Auditor Generals and also Parliamentary Committees go on study tours. So for instance, in Uganda, the Auditor General and his staff took a week, went to, went to Ghana a few years ago to learn how the Ghanaian Auditor General, um, you know, 
who's able to do, to do their work and how they've overcome a lot of challenges in the gone. So they're really trying to learn from each other. And lastly, the last thing, is that you really see a lot of um, both citizen groups and also government entities really trying to find innovative strategies that take into account on the ground realities. So for instance, the budget monitoring citizen groups, um, you know, even if the budget, even if the government provides a budget, a lot of the population is illiterate and can't, can't read the budget. So what these groups have, have done instead, instead of trying to um, get the word out through print media, they've turned to radio. They have radio programs, radio ads, that really do reach a, a larger number of people. And so, so in the end, I think there really is you know, room for hope that, um, that Africans are trying to address these challenges themselves um, and taking on that responsibility for holding the government to account um, in, in, in any way they can. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Jean-Louis Kouziza, um, presenting Robert Davis's paper. Uh, with the daunting title, Democracy in Africa, A Very Short History. Thank you for, um, well, not inviting me, for <coughs> inviting Robert Bates. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so let me just uh, say again that this is not my paper. It's uh, Robert Bates' paper. And um, it's not easy to stand in uh, Robert Bates' shoes. I think everyone here would agree. But I was asked to do this, so I'm going to do that. Um, actually, when I was pre preparing this uh, PowerPoint, at times I was tempted to bring in my own, you know, my own ideas, but I refrained from doing that. And uh, what you see here is Robert Bates' text. Uh, there is just probably one or two instances where I chip in something, and I'll let you know when when I get there. So it's a uh, Robert Bates uh, text. Uh, this is the, the outline of uh, my presentation. First will be the key message. I always try to start with the key message so that when I run out of time, at least we take home something. <laughs> so key message. Then it will be democracy. I'll discuss briefly the concept of democracy and then the history of democracy through different, uh, uh, sorry, democracy in Africa and policies pursued through different political regimes in Africa, then the political reforms, and then a brief conclusion. Now, this is the key message from Robert Bates' paper. It's that democracy has been reborn uh, in Africa, and its renaissance has been accompanied by positive changes in public policies and better political practices. And he tried to back this up by some statistical evidence. But, of course, he also cautioned that political dangers remain and that African citizens should remain vigilant. Now, what is democracy? Democracy refers to different things according to the people trying to define democracy. Schumpeter, for example, defined democracy as open competition among rival political parties. But then, Dow would say that, okay, it is the definition by Schumpeter, but adding that you have also in a democracy to guarantee attendant rights and freedoms. We heard uh, about this this morning, uh, freedom to speak, freedom for association, and so on and so forth. And uh, Huntington comes with even more conditions really to define democracy, which is that the power the political party in power have to be able to surrender power upon, lo upon losing national election. And we have seen some instances of this not happening in some uh, African countries. So all these definitions agree on one thing, is that democracy has to use power for 
the public, uh, for the good of the public, not for the good of those in power. So this is really what is called the essential property of democracy, whatever definition uh, one uses. Now, a brief history of democracy in Africa, starting from what, what Robert Bates calls the indigenous roots. Indigenous roots really refers to what happened in, what was happening in Africa before colonial rule. Now, he says that there were democ democratic tendencies in pre-colonial societies. One, the linear system in many African countries eluded domination by a centralized state. So they wanted to be kind of, to get, to have, to preserve some independence. In other places, the prime minister's post was reserved for commoners. So it wasn't, you know, the, uh, the king or the princes who would hold uh, this post. And in many other countries, you had uh, commoner councils who exerted checks and balances on public administration. I added Burundi, this is my addition. So in Burundi, this was the case. There, there was a council of commoners that was exerting uh, checks and balances on uh, public administration. And there are also societies, actually he put in brackets, some of them secret societies in some African countries, which organized to defend uh, for commoners' interests. And he gave the example of the Asafo in Ghana. And he also recognizes that during that period, the bargaining power of the masses was much stronger than the bargaining power of the elites. Now, of the current elites, okay? So this is the indigenous roots uh, of uh, democracy. Now, came foreign occupation. The imperial powers imposed local rulers where political authority had been resisted. I've already mentioned that in some places, the linear system was trying to resist a centralized uh, authority. Now comes the imperial powers. They impose their own uh, rulers on, on these types of societies. In some instances, they um, replaced the old rulers by uh, new ones that they chose themselves. In some other instances, they used the old rulers but converted them to their cause, okay? And uh, that is what he called through opportunistic alliances. Now, of course, these changes created a kind of uh, contested space uh, within which the chiefs, those who were uh, acting as chiefs and headmen, could, you know, could maneuver. They found ma uh, room for maneuver. So they created new interests, new interest groups, and so on and so forth. And this is what uh, say by said. When chiefs now exploited these political positions, they tried to promote uh, their own interests, acquiring land, uh, extracting taxes from the population, promoting their kin, and so on and so forth. And uh, I would say that there are societies which are still uh, showing this kind of uh, characteristics in Africa. Now, this changed when uh, European empires collapsed after the wars. So there was a kind of transition after the Second uh, World War. Nationalist movements drew upon and renewed democratic impulses embedded in local institutions. Basically, nationalist movements kind of went back to the traditional institutions which were uh, prevailing before the colonial rule and tried to build around those institutions. Where this did not happen, it is particularly where these institutions had failed to really act for the good uh, of the public when they allied themselves with the colonial powers. <coughs> Imperial powers also, they began to promote democratization as a way of disengaging from an enemy they could not defeat. These are words from uh, uh, the paper. Now, they could not defeat, especially after the Second World War, they were weakened and then they could not really keep uh, you know, their grip on uh, their colonies. So came uh, these changes. <coughs> so basically the key 
the key motivation for this change was uh, to find a way of uh, exiting uh, Africa uh, towards a kind of political surrender. But they just wanted to negotiate a kind of advantage, advantageous uh, political surrender. But you can imagine that the, the apparatus they favored was not necessarily in the interest of the African uh, people, the African citizens. So the apparatus they put in place was one which protected the institutions that had secured foreign domination in the first place. Now, during the independence period, the forces that took over colonial state did not really endorse political competition, given the institutional background that just defined, because those people who had been favored by the retreating uh, uh, European uh, colonizers were not necessarily pursuing the good of uh, the African citizens. And uh, there is, I'm going to show you some tables, uh, some graphs and tables. When we look at uh, the fate of opposition parties, just after independence, you see how uh, the changes were really against uh, plurality. Okay. Unlike what happened before independence, and this change was not really a consolidation, that was wanted by these political parties. It was rather uh, forced. It was a forced consolidation through methods like uh, rigging elections, jailing opponents, outlawing political parties, uh, coup d'etats, and so on and so forth. So by the mid-90s, authoritarian regimes had become the norm in Africa. Now this is uh, one of uh, the figures which shows how things evolved from the early 70s to the mid-90s. So, well, I don't have a point here, but ones, there are ones and zeros. One is not authoritarian. One uh, not author authoritarian means a country which is led by uh, someone who is not from the army and who was put there through, through an election, basically. Now you can see how, uh, how it evolved. Uh, in the 70s, 80s, 90, uh, late, until the late 80s, uh, authoritarian regimes really dominated. You can see that. Now, starting from the 90s, there was an improvement. That's the last uh, kind of thing. Now, this is another way of looking at the same issue, using now the type of system which is in place, the no party system, single party system, and competitive party system. So ones are the first, first column, second, the single party are second one in the middle, and the third one is uh, competitive party system. So it's more or less the same story. See from the 70s, 80s, you see that the first two columns dominate, which are the no party and single party system. And then in the 90s, you see some improvement where the competitive party system dominates. Now, what are the policies that were put in place by these different regimes? In the post-independent period, political powers Political power was mobilized for economic development. And this was really a kind of congruence between politics and economics. The economic doctrines of the time, this is the 60s, were really kind of advocating government intervention uh, in the economy, government managing the economy. So the politicians liked that, they liked that, because it would mean they would be in control. So that was uh, the system that dominates in the 60s, uh, 70s. And this control, this kind of controlled regime was uh, called, there is a, let me, well, now this is me speaking, but Robert Bates also refers to this. The African Economic Research Consortium did a major work trying to document the history of Africa, Africa's growth, economic growth from the, basically from independence, from the early 60s or late 50s to 2000. So they published two volumes on, on this. And uh, so that is what they call, and I, I was actually involved in, uh, uh, in that project. So that is what they call the control regime. The control regime is exactly what we're talking about here, where the state 
was uh, controlling the economy. So the control regime institutionalized the bias in favor of uh, the nascent urban elites uh, while penalizing the rural economy. Now, this is uh, the prevalence of uh, control regimes across time. Again, you see that the 70s, second half of the 70s, all of the 80s, really, it was dominated by control regimes. Now, it went down, and uh, most recently, it's actually the lowest level we've ever seen since the 70s. Sorry. But then there, was, there were cracks in the edifice. Why? Because this control regime could not be sustained economically. Because there were, for example, currency overvaluation, overtaxation of agriculture, which penalized exports, and encouraging imports. So countries were importing more and more while exporting less and less. So they had huge deficits. And governments had to borrow heavily to finance these deficits. But eventually, the lenders stopped lending. Why? Uh, well, one, was, one reason was Mexico's default. But they, they saw that countries could actually default on their debt, so they didn't want to keep just lending uh, without making sure that they get their money back. Now, of course, this created uh, a difficult economic environment, and uh, the economies, African economies, really declined a lot in the 80s. In Africa, they called the, uh, the 80s the lost uh, decade for economic development. The 80s were the lost uh, decade. But all these negative results did really, did not seem to affect the, the uh, the politics in the continent. On the contrary, many of these controls, at least in the short term, they kind of strengthened the, the politics in place. Why? Because these controls gave them the power, let's say, to allocate resources, the power to allocate foreign currency, the power to appoint uh, people in government institutions, the power to, to appoint people in uh, state uh, enterprises. All this was uh, all this was uh, adding to their political power. But the result of this was uh, discontent. The populations were suffering from this. And um, in a way, this, uh, the polity, they lost their legitimacy because of the policies they were uh, pursuing. Now, there were also external forces which uh, ex started ex exerting criticism on Africa, particularly the uh, creditors, Africa's creditors, because they wanted to get uh, their money paid uh, back. So there were different interests at play, in play. There were managers, what Robert Bates called managers of Africa's debt. And here, well, in the paper, something I didn't bring in here is that uh, at some time, they went. To, uh, Africa's creditors got together. They formed clubs. They formed groups so that they could exert more pressure on uh, uh, their, de uh, their, uh, their debtors. And then uh, the World Bank comes in here as uh, uh, one of uh, these institution, these institutions which were exerting pressure. Now, the other pressure was coming from Africans themselves, which needed change to improve their standards of living. But, as you can imagine, political powers opposed uh, this change. And uh, there, are two now two, there were two powers in play here. The political powers from outside the continent, which for geostrategic reasons, kept you know, helping uh, these African uh, leaders despite their poor uh, performance in terms of uh, uh, governance and so on and so forth. Uh, we know examples. I don't need to, to cite them here. Of course, the, the idea was that the, the cost, economic cost of bad policies was judged by Western powers to be worth paying, but it's worth paying by the Africans. Okay. Now, the fall of the Berlin War in 1989 created a new international political order, which really precipitated uh, many of the changes we have uh, seen uh, recently. Now, dictators which had been shielded, which had been protected 
uh, by the Western powers were just uh, set aside, okay? And uh, here again I use that word as cynically as they had once been employed. Now, and this process started in uh, Francophone Africa, uh, in Benin, most uh, particularly. I'll show you a table of, uh, of how, it, how it went. It, it started with uh, what was called uh, Conférence Nationale in many Francophone uh, African countries. This is what, uh, so countries came together, uh, sorry, citizens, uh, interest, uh, civil society, they went together and organized kind of power that uh, opposed the uh, traditional uh, power. And then this was uh, a good time for also the external uh, forces which kind of joined the domestic forces to push uh, for change. And uh, this time there was little uh, resistance for, from Western government, which had been resisting change for geostrategic reason uh, in the past. Now, I don't know if uh, you can read this one. This is a list of uh, countries where this conference national, national conventions, if you want to, in English, where they were organized. And you can see that after this conference national, there were elections organized in those countries. And uh, in some of these countries, these were the first ever elections uh, organized. I think this is uh, some interesting information to, uh, to look at. Now, of course, the push for reform incited a violent reaction from the, the inco incumbents. The rulers feared that reprisals would just be, I mean, there, there would be reprisals if they lost uh, the power that they had basically the power to control the police, the army, the power to send people to jails, and so on and so forth. But as democratic forces mobilized, so the efforts to repress this democratic tendency is also uh, organized. And uh, we give the examples of Togo, Kenya, Zaire, uh, Zimbabwe, uh, Rwanda. Now, but as incumbents became insecure, Opposition also politicians mobilized. They also mobilized their supporters. Some of them recruiting from the streets, thugs basically, recruiting thugs from the street. Some others forming militias. And these militias kept uh, their weapons even after the changes uh, had uh, happened. So as a result, political reform was accompanied by, with militarization of uh, civil, civic life. And I have some Interesting graphs here. This show the one on the, let me start with the one on the right hand side. This is, uh, it shows how one, no, no party, single party, multi party, how it evolved. So basically there was a huge improvement in the 90s, from the late 80s to the uh, today, to the mid, uh, to late uh, 90s an improvement in, so having more multi-party systems. But then you also have on the left-hand side percentage of country years with reports of militias, okay? So you see these figures have the same trend. They go in the same direction. So basically, what Robert Bates tries to draw from this uh, data is that these two were kind of as, uh, associated. So political change was associated with a kind of militarization. And it eventually also heightened the probability of civil wars. And you see uh, the evolution of civil war in Africa uh, across uh, time. But what he says <laughs> is that the period, although there was violence during the period of reform, transition, it is the transition to democracy which was violent. It is not a steady state. Violence was not a steady state because you could see that violence started now going down after, uh, I mean, in the uh, 90s. Now, political reform quickly here. The competitive elections empowered the rural majority. So there was a slight improvement in the bias against the rural economy. And um, relative to now, there are also some statistics here. Let me actually just show you this. 
this is a, a figure which shows how uh, the relative rates of assistance to agriculture <coughs> as a measure of uh, the bias towards the agriculture sector. So when the red line is zero, it's a zero. So whenever you find a negative value, it means a bias uh, against agriculture. So you see that Africa is throughout the whole, almost throughout the whole period, it's negative. It's the yellowish uh, line. Now you can see in Europe, Western Europe, North America, a huge uh, bias for agriculture due to electoral reasons. And uh, it comes out very clearly. Now, when you just take the African continent, just the African continent, compare the countries in Africa, you see that the countries which have uh, had electoral competition have a lower bias against agriculture, which is a little kind of flat line uh, below the red line. Those without electoral competition have uh, the red line. You see how it goes negative. Now, conclusion. There is some suggestive evidence that the types of institutions in Africa explain the differences with which governments have employed their power. And uh, political reform has elicited political restraint and higher quality of governance. But the problem is, will this reformist kind of tendency endure or erode? Potential for backsliding is strong. We know that, uh, I mean, people this morning have, have spoken about this, that we see some tendencies of backsliding. So he ends by paraphrasing John Adams at the Constitution, Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, calling Africans should remain vigilant. Thank you very much. Thank you for that wonderful uh, representation of Mr. Bates' paper. Uh, our, next speaker, our next speaker, okay, the next speaker is uh, Professor Mweni, and the title of her talk is, um, what happened? Sorry, <laughs> here it is, uh, Kubi Kucha, it is Daybreak. Colonial and post-colonial state and its developments and developments in Africa. Best morning. Thank you uh, very much, uh, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. And uh, my presentation is somehow different in the sense that uh, I look at things from below. If you have a visitor who comes to New York and uh, meets a homeless person, the view that homeless person gives is very different from the mayor of New York or a student here. So there are different ways of looking at uh, issues. And just uh, to clarify what uh, I'm presenting about, I want really to show that by talking about Africa, we have to realize how big it is so that uh, we don't uh, generalize. So I'm just uh, putting this here from a global studies just to show the size of the continent and how different each section is, each uh, country is, not only based on uh, class, race, and gender, but also culture, religion, uh, uh, geographical conditions, whether it's dry, uh, fertile, and all that. So we are really looking at a very big uh, continent. And you remember that picture there, we look at this, I don't need to go over uh, the history because I have, uh, uh, we have heard a lot from the other uh, panelists. My paper will mainly focus at the relationship between political institutions and the people. What is that relationship? <laughs> and as I say, I am looking at it from below. And when you look at things from below, the view is very different. What, the first question is, what, what is the relationship between 
people and their political institutions, what is the standard of living for most, uh, uh, the majority of the people. And uh, by talking about standards of living, I'm not comparing with uh, the Western world. I am uh, looking at uh, basic, just basic things that human beings need uh, to survive. And also, I'm also asking what happens when policy ignores people, people who are supposed to be the center of everything. When they are removed from that process, what happens? So that when we speak, we speak about uh, we are making progress, we are making breakthroughs, uh, there are chances of backsliding and all that. You almost think of a patient in an intensive uh, care, and you wonder why, why, why these moments of backsliding and all this, what is really happening. So I look at I, uh, the issues on the basis that we can't use one perspective to study African countries. We can't uh, look at it from modernization, which was very popular in the 50s, and sadly I see it uh, today uh, when uh, people, uh, when studies are given as progressing, improving, uh, all those terms, we have to study uh, uh, these institutions in their own right, and also to talk about the law of culture. What happens, can a people develop outside their culture? And if that development takes place, what is the price uh, of that uh, process? So the first question is, uh, where are the people in the state? And uh, I don't uh, need to really emphasize so much about uh, the colonial period where even uh, whenever colonial powers or people uh, spoke, they would talk about our Africa, our Africa. And some of the people who are alive now who negotiated for independence uh, especially in, uh, between 1960 and 1963, they said openly that when they went to negotiate, they were told, yes, you can have a, your political power. Have all the political power you want, but our resources are ours. Leave them alone. When we talk about African countries, we have to talk about the resources, because a lot of times that is forgotten. Yesterday in a panel, we heard about uh, how they say uh, so much poverty and nobody is uh, benefiting. There are groups that are benefiting both the elite, of course, and those who are contacting businesses there, and also the ones who are benefiting from the resources. We can't lift a cell phone or use a computer without using something from the DRC, something that belongs to people who are not benefiting from it. So we have to remember that idea of our Africa. And now if something goes wrong, the first thing is to say, who is our man? It's always our man. Who is our man over there? So it's interesting to see also how this idea in, uh, informs the infrastructure so much so that it is easier to travel from La uh, Nairobi to London than it is to travel from Nairobi to Mozambique or Dakar. So uh, we see also that idea as far as uh, uh, Congo was uh, concerned that we are giving you something special, do not destroy it. So we have changed in leaders, but the institutions remain the same. And uh, the goals of the colonial state also remain the same, which was maximum exploitation. They are again moved to the post-colonial uh, period, and the goals again uh, continue. There's never a question of what is the relationship between these institutions and the people. This was written by General Johnson on, uh, in the Congo, and of course he said before independence is going to be the same as after independence. Expe except that we have more actors that are 
getting involved. Actors that are dealing uh, the, their states also to protect. And also that become very important because the elites are their interests that they have to protect the trans, uh, national organizations. And of course, NGOs, where in the case of population control, you find girls who are between 10 and 15 are given to, uh, the equivalent of uh, $2, less than a dollar, to go and uh, bring their friends so that they can get contraceptives. This morning we heard about the, uh, someone who uh, talked about uh, doing no harm. There's a lot of harm that is done to people uh, in villages without any outcry. And that is what needs uh, to be uh, to stop if we are really going to move forward. So when we think about African countries, we are reminded of uh, this quote from uh, Thoreau, and uh, no offense is meant here. There are a lot of people who are well-meaning, but uh, also there are others who take this opportunity to, uh, to exploit people who don't know uh, much or people who really, uh, do not know what, uh, what is happening. And this is why we have to remember all the time that uh, advice to do uh, no harm. So when we think of development, we also need to think about uh, Claude Ake, the Nigerian political scientist, who asked, can a group of people, however well-meaning they are, develop another group? We have uh, to start listening to what the people are saying. We have to bring the people back so that we can hear what they are saying. They may be different, they may have uh, different ways of doing things, but they know that way. They know the way that works best for them. We have a lot of uh, experts uh, from very good uh, schools in the US and all over the world, yet their policies do not work. And nobody is asking, why aren't these policies working? What can we learn from these people? What can we learn? The, uh, the persistence of pushing the, uh, the policies even when they don't work also shows the arrogance of power. And also the idea that Africans and Africa are victims, that are, uh, they can only be helped. They, can, they can't do something on their own. But that, that, that is a big mistake because there are a lot of uh, groups there that are willing to make differences and that, are will, uh, that know something is wrong, but uh, there, there's no one who is listening. So who creates the roadmap? When I look at it, I see liberation uh, for African countries in three stages. The first stage was political control uh, by Africans, which of course did not entail economic control. The second one is the struggle against neocolonialism, this appearance of freedom without economic control, of political rights without uh, having somewhere to, to eat, of uh, the right to debate, very good uh, development, but uh, no right to, health, uh, to, to be treated. You go to the intensive care, uh, if you can't uh, pay upfront, you can die in that hospital because you are, you are forced to pay in cash. What type of development takes people outside uh, the process? The last stage of this uh, liberation is control by economic resources. We can dance all around it, but there is no freedom without economic control. If I don't control the resources within my border, I can't speak of any uh, freedom. Economic control is the heart of the struggle and the biggest struggle that is going on now as we see rebel movements moving in and saying, this is ours. Yes, you are a multinational com uh, company, but you have no right to come here and start taking what is mine and creating your own security firms. And that is really where the struggle is going to be. And I just have this quote uh, from uh, John Saul, uh, of course, that uh, really to show how important it is to recapture control over uh, the economy and also 
the, uh, in the past hour, some of the African uh, leaders have openly, as in the case of Mozambique, said, I don't need, I, I don't need uh, to pretend that I am the ruler of this country. My country has been taken over, and there are different agencies that are running it, and I'm honest about it, but others are quiet, but they, they know that they are not controlling uh, the economic uh, resources as long as they have their money, they don't care what happens to the rest of the population. So uh, going back, because uh, again the relationship is between the people and their political institutions. A relationship that is complex. I can't just look at the leaders alone. I can't just look at institutions alone. I have to look at it as a complex uh, three-pronged system. And, and imagine you are in a house and uh, you only use your bathroom to look outside. You only see the view from the bathroom. But if you go to a bay window, you will see the whole view. And to study and understand Africa, uh, African countries, we need to do that to take a long-term perspective, which is interdisciplinary, brings in all the areas of study, and which really goes beyond uh, the colonial period, goes to the uh, ancient period, looks at the uh, indigenous systems that were there, the forms of democracy that existed. And uh, democracy was not, there were no tendencies. It was in place. And by looking at that, we are not romanticizing or looking at a period when we were caught kings and queens. We are just looking at institutions that can be brought to the present and can be combined with modern technology and work so that they can work for the people as they decide it. So that becomes very crucial. So reconstituting these states, these political entities so that it can function, because right now, most of the people ignore the state because it is an obstacle. If I have a relative who is in Somalia, I, I just move on and go. I don't go through the border because I will be asked for a piece of paper, which I don't understand. And I ignore the state because the state is related, the institutions of government are related, are seen as uh, the ones that force people to do certain things. So people are already making their own movements. People are already, already deciding what they need to do. And there's a generation that we, uh, uh, George Aita has talked about, the cheetah generation that has seen the so-called uh, fruits of independence, and that knows some, that something is wrong and something must de be done. And this generation has become crucial in this movement. So how do uh, the elders, the reconstitution, uh, happen? To do so, of course, economic policy making, which has been taken over by bilateral institutions, has to be at the center of the uh, this uh, movement and also the leadership has to be in place. And by leadership, I don't mean looking for a messiah, looking for a Nelson Mandela who is going to save everybody. No, I am talking about the people this, uh, as we see this young generation moving on and looking and seeing that things are not working right. That leadership starts to grow from that uh, particular group. And uh, the idea that all belong uh, together. So this, again, is an idea, an idea that might take place, or an idea that may never take place, but it is based on ideas that change begins. So instead of having those breakdown of uh, 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 African countries, as we saw before, the reconstituting the state would be based on a federation of African states, this has been talked about before by uh, Kelechi Kalu, is also here, and Ali Mazrui and Macau Wamuto, how uh, to combine certain states so that instead of having so many that are competing uh, against each other, we have the uh, super states that are organized uh, based on the relations between 
uh, the groups and also based on trade patterns that are in place and of course uh, language. So what we see today is uh, we, are, we know that the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo is the heart of uh, the continent and with the resources that the Congo has, the, uh, it can feed uh, a lot of people and uh, also provide a lot of uh, electricity. So if you look at the continent and the size and uh, the resources that are there, it is not overpopulated. It is actually underpopulated. And then we look at uh, the movement that uh, is in place, which is very difficult. It's very difficult for an African from Ethiopia even to, uh, to travel to Kenya or Somalia or even uh, South Africa than uh, it is for someone to come from uh, a Western country to travel. So if this is made freer, people are allowed to move uh, and goods to flow within the continent, there are a lot of changes that are going uh, to happen. This is already happening on the ground, but it's not recognized because of that persistence that the, the colonial states that were created must stay there even though they have failed to deliver uh, what the people need. And then, of course, uh, we would have uh, Zimbabwe. The names can always be changed, but it would uh, be made up of those uh, countries. And democracy, I see a lot whenever we talk about democracy, uh, of the assumption that democracy is something that must be introduced to Africa. No, it has always been there. And uh, democracy, I, I, when some people talk about, they emphasize a lot of uh, political parties and all that. But following Claude Ake, for uh, democracy really to be valid, it has to have collective and individual rights. It also has to have economic, political, it also has to meet economic, political, and social needs because uh, it's very important that uh, the economic needs of the people are met, at least the basic ones. In the case of South Africa, there was a lot of criticism when right after 1994, a lot of the African majority expected change. A lot of, uh, economically, a lot of people started talking about an entitlement mentality. It's not an entitlement mentality to expect change for the better, especially economically. It is good to cast the vote, but if I have to starve and uh, have nowhere to sleep, what, how is it going to help me? So the people want to see something concrete, not just abstract uh, rights. So this is how it looks like now, uh, how it is divided. Uh, and from uh, you look at uh, Zimbabwe and uh, you look at Kenya in East Africa, both are growing flowers, both are competing for markets in Europe, and. Uh, both, of course, are uh, former uh, British uh, colonies. So in a reconstituted state, instead of competing against each other, they will be trading with each other, and uh, movement will be uh, faster uh, within uh, the continent so that uh, people are allowed to travel. They, instead of being a Nigerian, a Senegalese, you are an African. Because when the Ku Klux Klan starts chasing you, frankly, they don't stop to ask you, are you Ethiopian? They just chase you. So instead of uh, being, uh, uh, having these uh, identities, you would have one identity. And yes, of course, as I say, there are a lot of uh, issues to take into account here in terms of language, religion, and also the groups that are benefiting from uh, the situation that is in place now. There are a lot of uh, agencies that are uh, already uh, testing on uh, African women and kids for AIDS vaccines without any permission, and others that are uh, involved in uh, sterilizing, uh, sterilizing uh, people. You go for in to see a, do uh, a, a doctor, and then when you come back, you find something has happened and you are never informed. That should not be happening 
in a world that cares. That should not be happening in the name of development. So instead of having these breakdowns, we would, uh, of course, uh, be having a lot of uh, trade within each other. And this is uh, from Nyerere just before he died, he came to South Africa, spoke to Parliament, and uh, really, all, uh, as he always uh, spoke, reminded the Africans how the continent is isolated and that to develop, it must not, it, it must cease looking elsewhere. It, it must look within itself because that then ends the age of dependency, whether on churches, on alcohol, on family, on uh, people abroad, when people realize I either do it or I am dead. Otherwise, if they are expecting charity, they will never do anything. Every time they just wait for charity and they stop landing or doing anything because they know someone somewhere is going to give them something for free. So that is the map now and in a new reconstituted that is how to group like. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, our final speaker is Dr. George Ayite, and his uh, presentation is entitled Traditional Institutions and the State of Accountability in Africa. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the, uh, the new School for Social Research, um, Roberta and uh, Alvin, for uh, putting this uh, conference together. And I'm always pleased to speak uh, to Americans like you, uh, because it touches me for your concern and care about Africa. And um, I'd like to sort of uh, follow up with uh, some of the observations made by Mwemi Wa Mui. Uh, it is important, it is important because <clears throat> this is one of the very few African solutions that I have seen for the problems in Africa. And I emphasize African solutions because for far too long there are so many people who want to help Africa, but unfortunately, the solutions proposed to help Africa don't work. They don't work because quite often they are foreign or Western. And I, I, I'm not trying to put on Western uh, solutions. It is important to, that we understand this. Now, if you want to help a people, you help a people with a solution which fits into their own cultural and sociological milieu. You don't impose foreign or alien solutions on them. And this is exactly why things went so wrong in Africa. Now let me explain this. Western solutions are based upon individuals. Okay? Because in the West, the basic economic and social unit is the individual. The American says I am because I am, and I can damn well do anything I want, anytime I want to. And that's fine. But in Africa, the African says I am because we are. The we emphasizes the community. For far too long, we have taken Western solutions to Africa which don't work. It is also important to emphasize that Western jurisprudence is different from African jurisprudence. Western jurisprudence emphasizing punishing the guilty. African jurisprudence emphasizing reconciliation, restitution, and forgiveness. This was what was applied in South Africa with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Now, could you imagine if South Africa had wanted to apply Western jurisprudence to the victims of apartheid and uh, to the perpetrators of apartheid, could you imagine the consequences? How many whites would have been left in South Africa? 
Almost all the whites will have been found guilty. But South Af Africa preferred the African solution, which was what the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was all about. It's exactly the same thing in Rwanda with the genocide there is. Now, if Rwanda had tried to, to, to attempted to try all those people guilty of genocide, there were 100,000 of them. With Western jurisprudence, it will have taken Rwanda more than 250 years to try all of them. Instead, Rwanda reverted to its traditional system, the traditional system of gachacha. Now, where the guilty will face, you know, the victims apologize, for example. The reason why I'm emphasizing this is that for many, many, many years, we never sought African solutions for African problems. And that's why a lot of things went wrong in Africa. We're talking about accountability, freedom of expression, democracy. I think these are things which are alien to Africa. <coughs> I mean, you go to an African village and tell a village about how do you hold your chief accountable? He will laugh at you. Because no African chief can loot the tribal treasury for deposit in Switzerland. No African chief. You can challenge me on this. And no African chief can declare himself chief for life and his village will be a one-party state. No African chief can do this. And no African king can even do any of these hideous atrocities the leaders are perpetrating on their, on their people today. Why? Because the traditional African chief has no political role. The traditional African chief, his role is cosmolo cosmological. He's supposed to maintain balance between the three cosmological forces. And I'll explain this in a minute. And that is, see, the, the way Africans, you know, look at the universe was like they saw the universe made up of three cosmological uh, forces. The sky, the world, and the earth. Each one of them was represented by a god. And the king's role was to maintain balance and harmony among these three gods. If the sky god was angry, then there would be rain and thunder and floods. And if the earth god was angry, then it means that agricultural harvest would be poor, women would be barren, there will be farming, etc., etc. If any of these catastrophes occurred in the village, then it meant that the king had not done his duty. And <coughs> off went he said. That was regicide. Oh, how I wish they would bring regicide back. <laughs> the Mugabe's and the Zinawis and the Gaddafi's never had it so lucky. <laughs> the point, of course, they have, you know, regicide, uh, regicide had been abolished, but the point which I want to make is that <laughs> the king was held accountable. The Yoruba king even could not venture out of his palace. You see, African kings were secluded in their, uh, in their palaces so that they can keep their royal fingers out of people's business. The Yoruba owner could only come out of his palace under the cover of darkness. And for a whole year, he could only venture out of his palace once a year. That was how African kings, they, 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 their role was not political. Their role was supernatural. To, to maintain harmony, you know, it was an invention for them to maintain social harmony. They didn't have any political role. So if the king didn't have a political role, how could a king be a dictator? They didn't fit into that particular type of traditional system. But let me come to the chief, the African chief. In traditional Africa, there are two ways by which uh, various ethnic groups organize themselves. Those of, uh, uh, ethnic groups who organized themselves <coughs> had two types of systems. There were those ethnic groups, I will use the tribe, uh, the term tribe, uh, interchangeably, who felt that any centralized authority was necessarily evil and tyrannous. So those tribes, in fact, 
Among these tribes, these were the tribes which uh, took the uh, concept of freedom to its most radical uh, extent. They didn't want to have any centralized authority at all because they felt that any centralized authority is necessarily tyrannous. So they dispensed with chiefs. And those ethnic groups are the Igbo, the Gikuyu, and the Somali. Those were the ones who understood freedom. See, the Europeans had it in their head that any group must have a leader. But there were groups, tribes in Africa, who felt that any leader could necessarily be a dictator, so they, they, they themselves decided not to have any leader at all. Then there were those who decided to have a leader. The leader called the chief. Okay? But then they surrounded these leaders with councils upon councils upon councils to prevent them from abusing their power. If you took a, 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 you know, a chiefdom, for example, say the Ashanti chiefdom or the Ghan chiefdom, for example, there were three units of government. The first one was the chief. Okay? The second one was the council of elders. The council of elders was made up of the heads of various extended families in the village. Okay? Now, the chief couldn't remove the heads of those extended families. The extended families chose their own leaders, heads. And they came together. If there was a, a village with 10 extended families, then there would be 10 councillors. And the chief had to govern with the councillors. Without the council of elders, the chief was powerless. The chief couldn't make any law without the council of elders. In governance, the chief would put the issue before the council of elders. If it was important, they must all agree. If they couldn't, then the third unit of government came in, picked in. That third unit of government was called a village meeting. Very similar to New England's town hall meetings. Now that village meeting was commonplace across Africa. The chief, if the chief and the council of elders couldn't agree on an issue, they'll call a village meeting, put an issue before the, town, uh, the village meeting, and the villagers would debate things back and forth, back and forth, until they reach a consensus. Once a consensus is reached, then everybody in the village, including the chief, is required to abide by it. This is important. It is important because you can take democratic decisions in two ways. In the Western way, you can take a democratic decision by majority vote. Majority vote means all those in favor of a motion, you raise your hand, all those opposed, you count. It is fast, it is efficient, it is transparent, but it has a downside. The downside is that democratic decisions taken by majority vote ignores minority positions. The other way by which you can take democratic decisions is by consensus. Consensus means that you take all minority positions into account. The advantage here is that once you come to a decision by consensus, then you can be sure that everybody will go along with that particular decision. But that also has a downside. And the downside is that it takes an awfully long time to come to a consensus once the number of people increases. The traditional African system was the one which took its decisions by consensus. And this is one of the reasons why any African will tell you that the elders sometimes take weeks and they take months to come to a decision. But the point which I want to emphasize is that just because when you go to an African village, you don't see a box with ballot written on it, doesn't mean that the Africans had no idea about the essence of democracy. They took their decisions by consensus. The Nobel Peace Committee takes its decisions by consensus. The World Trade Organization, WTO, also takes its decisions by consensus. So there isn't only one way of defining democracy. That is important. Now, why did things go so wrong in Africa? Things went so wrong in Africa because when the colonialists came to Africa, 
the South Africans didn't have any institutions at all. So they imposed their own type of government and institutions upon Africa. We fought for our independence. But then, those incoming leaders also made one fatal and fundamental mistake. And that is, they never demolished their colonial structures. All that they did was that they simply replaced the white colonialists and retained the authoritarian colonial structure. We didn't dismantle it. As a matter of fact, in Zimbabwe, for example, in Zambia, we strengthened the colonial state. What was wrong with the colonial state? I like to point this out here because this is where we, a lot of, this has been the source of many of our problems. We've been talking about lack of accountability. We've been talking about impunity. We've been talking about, you know, uh, lack of freedom of expression. Where do all these problems come from? They come from one particular source. That source is the concentration of power in the hands of the state. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to recognize that if you create a political system and concentrate a lot of power in the hands of the state or one individual, that system, no matter where you are, would degenerate into tyranny, which is what we're seeing across Africa. There are three ways by which you can organize a political system. The first way is the unitary system in which all decisions are concentrated at the capital. This is the European model. All decisions taken in London or Paris or uh, Lisbon or Madrid, for example. This is what the European colonialists brought to Africa because that was the system they understood. Now that system is one which concentrates power at the center. The second system is the federal system, like the American system where the center is strong, but still you have states which have various you know, responsibilities. There's some decentralization of power. The third is the confederal system. The confederal system is where there's a great deal of devolution of authority and decentralization of power. That was the African model. The ancient empires in Africa, Great Zimbabwe, Mali, Ghana Empire, they were all confederacies. Now, the fatal mistake we made after independence was we never went back to build upon our own institutions. Instead, we retained the colonial unitary system. Now, the colonial unitary system is not suitable when you have a, a, a multi-ethnic or poly-ethnic nation, for example, because when you concentrate power at the center, then all sorts of groups compete. You make the state, you turn the state into a pot of gold. And all sorts of groups compete to try and capture the state. Once they capture the state, they use the state to advance their own ethnic or political or ethnic uh, interests and exclude everybody else. And this is the politics of exclusion we've seen in Africa for a long, long, long time. Look, the whites in South Africa monopolized and captured the state and use that to advance their own interests and exclude the blacks. That was the system of apartheid. But the whites in South Africa were not alone. The Hutus did the same thing in Rwanda. The, uh, Hutus, uh, the Tutsis also did the same thing in Burundi. And you can go across Africa. There were soldiers who monopolized power. And you can go to Sudan. The Arabs there, you know, monopolized power. So the source of the problem is a defective political system, the unitary system. And this is why I said that you know, Moini, well, Moini uh, model that she presented in terms of uh, federation of African states is where we should be moving. Now, what can we do? One of the things which we can do as scholars, for example, is not just talk about the problem, but at least try and do something about it. One of those, the challenges that I'll throw to you is to take a look at the military. The military is a colonial institution. The military, military rule is totally alien to Africa. 
It is a colonial institution and it's been the source of much destruction in Africa. Look at all those countries that imploded in recent years in Africa. Somalia was destroyed by General Siad Bari. Rwanda, General Juvenile Habriyamama. Burundi, General Pierre Bioya. Zaire, General Mobutu Sesoseko. Liberia, General Samuel Do. Sierra Leone, General Joseph Momoy. Nigeria, a whole host of generals. <laughs> Ivy Coast, General Robert D. Africa doesn't need any more of these, you know, uh, uh, any more of these. I call them military coconut heads. They have <laughs> No African scholar, no intellectual, should ever support a military regime in Africa, much less serve under one. I personally believe that we should disband these military regimes in Africa because they are totally alien. No traditional African society had standing armies. Only very few of them did have standing armies. Thank you very much. minutes left in this session and so I'd like to invite people to come down uh, to the microphone both here and here if they have to go Sorry. For Kristen McKee, um, when I was looking at the slides you were showing about the uh, dysfunctional government, uh, I was reminded of George W. Bush's. And so I was wondering whether Africa is supposed to come and watch that one as a model or whether Bush should have gone to Africa and used one of the countries in Africa as a model. Thank you. Can you introduce yourself? David Bookbinder. Um, just wanted to, vis-a-vis uh, -vis this um, idea of the five super states, um, could there not be a similar or reciprocal um, movement toward um, uh, sort of pre-colonial kingdoms like the like Buganda, Uganda, or what, similar to what's happening in with Somaliland, where there's uh, a more of a micro um, movement. Could you speak to that? Hi, my name is Lido, and uh, my question is specifically directed to Christine. Uh, how does the citizens be in? Does citizens have a role in budgeting, and how much can they be involved? in budgeting. Maybe you can base your, uh, your answer to this question on your experience in Uganda. Yes, I, I don't have a question. I'm just um, asking um, if someone is interested in your PowerPoints, would you all like to share it? And for the last speaker, um, uh, how can you provide um, information about, you know, just what you talk about, like in paper, if students are interested to take a look at the presentations again. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, uh, my question to our sister here, uh, the proposal of uh, big fives, if we compare this concept with what has been done in Sudan in all five, uh, peace agreement signed between the North and the South, where United States, United Kingdom, Japan, and other big countries gave the same Sudan the right to go for referendum, which means literally breaking down the country, one country into more small countries. However, Africans are trying to unite their countries in a big aside. So we can see, our, we can see ourselves in, in this kind of dynamics. The second question about the uh, multi-ethnic groups living in one society and uh, introducing a new conflicting concept in such society, the concept of genocide. In Africa, we know that we are being fighting together as tribes back and forth since last hundred years. And we say, oh, my tribe fight with another tribe, I tribe against my tribe. But the concept of genocide was born in the West. It has no much actually basics in African society because having that concept in the African new generation is going to create more troubles down the road. 
instead of just uh, conflict over water or rain or animals, it becomes kind of a genocide. Because your dad, from that ethnic tribe, he killed my dad because from a different ethnic tribe. So after 100 years, I'm going to kill your dad because your granddad killed my granddad and you see her go. So how do we see such kind of Western concepts transferred to African societies and how African societies can be early in the beginning of the process to address the future consequences of such concepts? We're going to take, please all be, try to be brief to the remainder of the people on this. Oh my goodness, there's more there. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, all right, let's take a couple more questions. Uh, and Pete, maybe we'll stop Pete, and take Peter Burgess, very, very quickly. Um, uh, Kristen talked about the various parts of the accounting, uh, the budget process. Uh, she succeeded in talking about uh, this without once mentioning the Ministry of Finance and the Treasury, and ideas like the single Treasury account, which were designed a long, long time ago to make sure that the money went in the right places. I, I'm bothered by the, the secrecy of the budget. And if you look at any of the budgets, you'll find that so much of what the, polit the political community, including the aid community, talks about, cannot be done with the money that's available. And then, of course, you've got uh, the point that uh, Dr. Yeti mentioned a moment ago, the money going to things like military is huge relative to the money going to uh, things like health. Um, but the solution that came in the last two presentations, I love, I love, I love, and thank you for that. Thank you. My name is Jerome from Brandeis University. I come from Ghana. Um, I have two concerns. My first concern is uh, the issue about China that was raised because we've also re we all realized that China is an economic giant. It's also a permanent member of the Security Council and it has demonstrated that it doesn't have the welfare, the interests of Africa at heart. How can we bring China to responsible behavior on the continent? My second concern has to do with multinational corporations. In most cases, they go into Africa, they corrupt, they bribe the, the, the political leaders, and they are giving concessions that, are, that enable them to exploit the resources of the country at the expense of the public and the masses. And there are some international mechanisms that can, we can use to call them to order for the benefit of the people. Thank you. Thank you. How about over here? Um, my name is Moyo. Um, I go to Mount Holyoke College and I'm, I'm from Nigeria. And my question is regarding the reconstitution of states. I was just wondering if maybe um, an emphasis on strengthening regional organizations like ECOWAS or even the African Union would help towards doing making some of the effects that the reconstitution of states are, or do you think that the reconstitution of states is the most effective way for um, development, essentially? Good afternoon, my name is Cliff Buckstrom, Jr. And I have two questions for Dr. Yudi. Um, the first one is, uh, and the young lady just alluded to it, we've heard about uh, Africa's development, uh, African solutions to African problems. But when we talk about that, I didn't hear anything about the leadership and management of the African Union and how it can impact and uh, affect some of what was discussed today. And secondly, I've come a long way, Dr. Yidi, today. I just wonder if you could sign the book. <laughs> <laughs> if I can catch you before you leave. <laughs> um, my question is to the last two speakers who really raised the issue of African history and African institutions. As a student of African history, um, I've noted that people usually uh, romanticize the pre-colonial period. And from what I've learned about so far is that the changes of happened for colonization, if you look back to the 15th, 16th, 17th century, were really also not um, as uh, natural. Basically, there were the same sort of changes that happened during colonial times, where you were dealing with matters such as the slave trade. So my question is, if you still have these, uh, you have these uh, pre-colonial institutions that are somehow traditional, but their roles and functions have changed over time, how is it that you can try to bring them back when you really do not know what the original role and function was. 
Hi, my name is Carol Metter, and I'm a research associate at the Public International Law and Policy Group in Washington, D.C., so thank you for having me. Um, I have a three-pronged question, if that's acceptable, Dr. Casimir. Yes, just trying to be quick with the three. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, the first one is for all of you, and that question is, how do you feel about the Federation of African States, more particularly to Dr. Kuruni Ziza and uh, Ms. Mackay? And I had a feeling of how the two of you feel about the Federation of African States. And the two questions I have for the last two on the forum is, first of all, um, I have some concerns about the political implications of the Federation of African States. Um, that being that my first response to it was, thank goodness Africa is drawing its own lines as opposed to colonialists drawing it for them. Uh, but my concern is, for example, in the groups that you pointed out, Somalia and Somaliland are interlinked in the same major region. However, uh, there's been a clear clash between the two for many, many years. Um, and Somaliland has well-established democratic institutions. So how would they feel politically about being linked in the same region with Somalia? Um, yet at the same time, you separate Northern Sudan and Southern Sudan, which as we know in the upcoming January 2011 <coughs> referendum, there will probably be ensuing violence and Southern Sudan might be a little upset uh, if they are not interlinked with economic connections that Northern Sudan would experience. Uh, and finally, my third question uh, is more expressing a fear uh, that although these democratic institutions are growing, uh, they have yet to be proven as effective as they could be. So the fear is that these various regions uh, would experience democratic institutions and experience more of a breadth, but not as much of a depth as they should have. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're, I'm sorry, we can only take the two, two more questions, one here and one here, so please go ahead. Good afternoon, my name is Christian Maylek. I'm a volunteer at the United Nations Democracy Fund. I'm also a student at Brandeis University. Uh, the rule of an army is to defend the state. Without an army, uh, we could have a lot of problems. Some decades ago, some chiefs even in Africa, had some kind of army without sophisticated uh, weapons. So I would like to know uh, how will you ensure the protection of the institu institution? And my second question is about the five states. The, the major problem in Africa is the question of division. Who would be leading these states? Thank you. Apologies. Um, we can only take one more question because I need to give the panelists a chance to to respond and we're almost out of time. Please. Thank you. Um, my name is Edie Lynch. I'm in international affairs at the New School, working on my master's. And my question uh, is to Professor Zaite and Professor Mulu. Um, I'm personally working on a film about the homeless kids that live in Rio de Janeiro. And I know of Professor Mulu that you said that if you have nothing to eat and no place to sleep, that um, you, you can't think about democracy. Uh, what I'm really concerned about is what practical ways do either of you have to, to help um, the, the children in Africa and what ways, um, really, truly realistic ways can we make the foreign governments that have been so involved in the corruption in Africa be accountable? Practical things that, that, that can happen. Thank you. Thank you. Again, sorry if um, we have to cut off the questions. So, uh, perhaps we can start with uh, Mwani. And there are so many questions, that, um, and we don't have a lot of time. So why don't you pick one or two that you'd like to respond to? And I'm sure afterward you can follow up with individuals um, after the session is over. Uh, thank you very much. I would like uh, to start with uh, the one on the tendency to break these states into uh, smaller uh, units, which becomes, of course, uh, another problem because uh, not only does it uh, politicize ethnicity, but also makes entities that cannot compete uh, internationally. So the case of uh, Sudan is uh, a very good one uh, to show that, and now also how already the, the people are arming themselves to prepare for the next war. And uh, the breakdown, uh, someone asked about the uh, African Union uh, and ECOWAS. We look at African Union, and if we really look at it, the way it was created, there was very little uh, uh, consultancy as far as the people are concerned. It's, 
created mainly from uh, above, and also its role, especially in Somalia, has uh, been uh, very negative. And uh, if uh, we go, if we were to go back to the map, we we'll see that uh, a lot of it, like what would be Nigeria, takes into account ECOWAS and, uh, of course, uh, SADC. And if you are interested, because there are a lot of questions, there are, uh, th the book is out there. You can uh, look at it, and you can also uh, speak <coughs> after this session. Thank you very much. And for the kids, some practical ways have been uh, to really help the kids to put uh, them in uh, schools, especially uh, homeless uh, uh, in East Africa, where they are called uh, parking boys uh, and girls. They would be taken, paid actually to go to school, and others have started homes uh, for them. And for the model, the Scandinavian model has been very effective because it goes down to the people and reduces the corruption. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think uh, somebody asked uh, if students are interested in following up on uh, uh, African traditional institutions, uh, what, where should they go? Uh, I like to say that I, I've written a book on indigenous African institutions. They can Google it, and uh, it's uh, available at Amazon.com. Indigenous African institutions. They can read all about uh, Africa's indigenous political systems, economic systems, social systems, legal systems. It's all in there in that book. Uh, number two, somebody asked a question about what to do about China. Um, uh, the Chinese are all over uh, in Africa, and right? they practice what I call chopsticks mercantilism. You know? and, and I think the only way we can deal with China is to tell the Chinese that you know uh, they can they should operate at their own peril. Uh, there is something called odious debt principle. If they go to Africa and hand money over to what uh, dictators or illegitimate governments in Africa, they should not expect the people to pay back those loans. Simple and as simple as that. It is called an odious debt principle. Okay. I like to say that I, I've written a book on indigenous African institutions. They can Google it and uh, it's uh, available at Amazon.com. Indigenous African institutions, they can read all about uh, Africa's indigenous political systems, economic systems, social systems, legal systems. It's all in there in that book. Uh, number two, somebody asked a question about what to do about China. Um, uh, the Chinese are all over uh, in Africa, and right? they practice what I call chopsticks mercantilism. You know? and, and I think the only way we can deal with China is to tell the Chinese that you know uh, they can they should operate at their own peril. Uh, there is something called odious debt principle. If they go to Africa and have money, governments in Africa. They should not expect the people to pay back those loans. Simple and as simple as that. It is called an odious debt principle. Okay. Uh, somebody also asked uh, about, <coughs> uh, somebody said, commented that, you know, we may probably be romanticizing about Africa's institutions. They are old, they are, they are hundreds of years old. But that is not a point. The point is not to romanticize. There are certain articles of uh, governance which are time-tested. They have withstood okay, the test of time. Okay? Accountability, for example, has, has withstood the test of time. And um, <clears throat> it is not, uh, let me give you an example, and I should have mentioned this in my speech. The village meeting that I, I mentioned, it is commonplace across Africa. Among the Ashanti, it is called Asitina Kesi. Among the Somali, it is called Guti. If you go all the way to uh, South, Southern Africa, the Zulus call it Indaba. Uh, in Botswana, it's called Kotla. Even in the, among the Igbo, it's called Amaala. The village meeting is not very, uh, very, very uh, common. Now, get this. In 1991, pro-democracy forces took exactly the same village meeting concept and modernized it into what is called a sovereign national conference. This was what was used to democratize Benin. Okay, that was where it started in Benin. And then it went on to uh, Sao Tome and principal Kivet Islands. Eventually, okay, it came down to South Africa. The way South Africa dismantled uh, apartheid was they convened a convention for a democratic South Africa. 
there were 400 and 244 delegates. The delegates came from all various sections of uh, South African society. They, they deliberated on the uh, future, the political dispensation of South Africa. They set up an interim government, set up a date uh, for elections, and also set up an interim constitution. That was how South Africa, uh, that vehicle that was used was a modernization of Africa's own indigenous village making concept. Okay? It started in Benin. This is why I was emphasizing African solutions to African problems. Notice that that particular transition was peaceful. It was also peaceful in Benin. And therefore, if it worked in Benin and South Africa and Cape Verde Island, it must work in Zimbabwe, it must work in Sudan, it must work in Chad, it must work in Ethiopia. This is what we should be pushing for, an African solution for the crisis in Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Just one comment on um, the Federation of uh, African States. What do I think about that? Um, here I put on my hands as an economist, I'm an economist by training. I think every economist would agree that many African states are not economically viable. They are so small that they are not economically viable. They, I think they have this morning they emphasize this point. And um, in my work, this is something we have looked at, African integration. How could Africa gain through this kind of federation, through uh, bigger integrating its economies. Africa trades just about 10% of its exports within the continent, just 10%, which is the lowest of any region in the world. Europe trades about 70% of its exports within Europe. So we can't really go far without you know, trying to, uh, to increase this kind of uh, trading among uh, African countries. And where countries are trying it, it's working. Look at the East African community. Things are, they are relatively working. It's five countries, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi. Uh, these countries now form the East African community, and we, we see changes since the formation of uh, this East African community. But why isn't it happening? Again, we come back to the same, the same problems, or the states, I mean, those who control the states. Because integrating means you, you agree to lose some of your sovereignty, okay? You agree to lose some of your power, your political controls. So this is what is holding back many uh, countries in Africa from, you know, opening up uh, their countries to uh, a, wider, a wider economic blocks or political blocks. This is the way that I see it. Thank you. Um, Kristen. I just wanted to quickly respond to the question about how and how much can citizens be involved in the budget process in their countries. And, and I think this is really going to be a learning process in, in, in many countries. And I think probably if I had to choose one key thing, it would just be to, to increase on the demand side. Citizens just asking their local and also national representatives um, questions about the budget, you know, questions about this project that was in, you know, initiated in their, in their, um, in their district. And as, as leaders and, and as politicians get to see more and more that, that this is something that constituents are really interested in, you know, hopefully they will respond by themselves becoming more educated in the budget process, becoming more interested in it, um, and hopefully that would push Parliament to then demand, you know, better information from the Ministry of Finance um, and, and, and the Executive. Um, so you're really starting by building that demand side, I think, is, uh, is one, one key, key factor. But it's, it's, going to be a, it's going to be a long process. Absolutely. 